So it's just gone half past four in the afternoon on the 22nd of November 2020. It's Sunday afternoon and I just nearly finishing up with these videos and I, I'm just amazed how this panorama thing just doesn't quit. It just keeps going and going and going and everybody's targeting either Martin Bashir or the BBC which which I find interesting because I don't see it as just one particular component of the machine. I see the whole machine as being flawed, the whole media, the whole setup really. I think it's it all feels like it's one big beast, one big corporation and you, you, you get in line with what that corporation wants to do or you get out and it was my decision to get out. It's kind of funny watching everybody targeting each other, like all these big columnists are targeting Bashir and BBC, but they're all part of the same illness. It's like everybody's got the flu, but they're pointing at one person whose nose is redder than the other. It's kind of funny on some abstract level, but ultimately the media causes a lot of problems. And it's not funny. It's the well, issues at hand are not funny especially when it comes to people's livelihoods, their careers. And in the case of the panorama thing, the lives of celebrities and royalty are at stake. And so it, there's a lot of issues here coming up. And I think if we just isolate the BBC and say that, that the BBC is to blame, I think we're missing the point. One of the things I would like to get to the bottom of is who decides that who who is who has controlled the media to appeal to the lowest common denominator, and who decides that we don't get any information about anything, and so that the public is dumbed down about what's really going on. I mean, whoever is holding the spotlight in the media is kind of distracting from the real issues and. That becomes like a type of obsession in your life. I don't know how people cope with it. I don't know how major celebrities and royalty cope with that scrutiny into your life the whole time. I mean, look at Michael Jackson. He died overdosing on a drug trying to get some sleep. I mean, how can you get sleep when you have all of that energy floating around your head? It must be extremely difficult. And while because you're talented or you've married a member of the royal family or you're a very you're very good at what you do you become this spotlight and it's not your choice to be part of the corruption of hiding what's really going on it's not part of your karma or your wish to become like the court jester to the side of the court dancing around distracting people from the real truth and it's 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 kind of sad for everyone and it's we have to look at not the celebrities themselves we don't blame them it's not diana's fault you know she tried to come out of the media a lot of times she was blamed for being attention seeking though at the end but she was trying to find out a way out of it out of the circus Here's a bunch of news people waiting outside the lawyers to get news of the divorce agreement. And and the whole point of the divorce was to try and end the soap opera, but it seemed to have the opposite effect. When I look at this, I just see a bunch of people trying to make a living. And it's very it's amazing how quick the, the people low down the scale are blamed for everything. Like when Diana was... First, she was in the crash. It was the paparazzi photographers. They were all jailed for a week or something, and they were investigated heavily, and every single media person was investigated, which quite rightly so, but it's always the little people that gets the blame first. Nobody looks into the system that's set up behind the scenes that creates this to begin with. Because for every idea or article that I would write, or one of these guys would write, they would have to get it approved by a news editor or a features editor. And then that features editor would have to go up to the editor, and so on and so forth. So what we could and couldn't write about was all decided from a management point of view. And so whoever set up a system that focuses on these salacious mundane aspects of people's lives like let's say a divorce or let's say a spot on somebody's nose or 
someone getting their teeth out, or like Katie Price, or whatever it is, that would focus on that and put that on the front page, and then put a topless woman in the next. But whoever decides all that is really the decision makers, the power brokers, the money men, and the money people. They are the people we should be looking at. And now, now that I've had a brush with this weird technology, this surveillance technology that I believe could have been used behind the scenes with the panorama interview or any interview or any media creation event, any story, any big story. Now I've seen this technology, that's a whole other level of manipulation that I never knew existed. And in the next clip, an ex-BBC journalist, Tony Gosling, talks about the advancements of technology and how the TV doesn't investigate anything anymore. They don't investigate the, all these things that are happening that changes our world. It was quite a good talk he gave in 2012 and it was entitled The Security Scandal, Criminal Gangs and Banking Media, Police and Government. And I will leave the link down below, but in this next clip, he talks about the the damaging consequences as a result of not having a media that can investigate issues properly. There was big changes at the BBC. If you remember, there was a kind of, if the, for the older among us, we can remember when we used to get things like World in Action and uh, this week, Death on the Rock, where a few weeks after the, the SAS had killed some uh, IRA terrorists, shot them, shoot to kill policy in Gibraltar. We had a documentary on the television explaining it to us this week, Jonathan Dibbleby. Nowadays we don't get any of that at all. It's just one after another lie. We were told the other, the other week, by the way, that the Syrian defence minister, a Christian, uh, who was killed by apparently a suicide bomber in, uh, in, the, in Damascus, in his uh, security headquarters, along with another general. That was the week before, that was last week actually, wasn't it? Last week, how time flies. Uh, that actually, all the witnesses have said that it was a drone strike. It's a missile came down from the ground. So we hear on the news in the morning it was a suicide bomber. And by the end of the day, it could be anything. Who cares, who knows? It was just a bomb. This meme of the suicide bomber is being used all the time to make out that the person that's doing it is a lunatic, they're dangerous, it could be anything. It could be a satellite weapon, you know, a drone. It could be a, like President Dudayev was, was assassinated, the head of Chechnya, by the Russians using a missile uh, that, that locked into his mobile phone. You check that one out online. He was talking, uh, someone phoned him to talk about peace and he's on his mobile phone, and a missile from a plane homes in on his phone and blows him to pieces. And he's the president of Chechnya. So this technology is out there, it's just that it's not on world in action anymore, because there was no such thing. We've got Panorama, but it's all very tame. It's all safe. Uh, and, you know, if, if nothing else comes out of this G4S story, I'd like to feel that we can give the British media a bit of a kick. <coughs> and say, well, look, come on, you know, let's have some really investigative journalism. And so he's right, of course. And um, this Chechnya leader he was talking about was assassinated in 1996, and it was done through the use of his mobile phone. And this information was completely buried. This is the first I'd heard of it. And maybe it's the first time you've heard of it as well. The interesting part for me is the date, 1996, because when I was thinking about, okay, well, what if the technology that was used to attack me was in existence at this time of the Panorama interview, which was 95? I mean, of, and, the, and the more I read about this, this secret technology, and some of it was there in the 50s, and in the 70s, and some of the patents and the Nobel Peace Prizes were won in the 70s. So from my my basic understanding, which is not an expert level understanding, but from my basic assessment is that this technology has been around an awful long time. And of course it could have been around at the Panorama interview. 
just as if, if, if the army or the military can come in and assassinate somebody via their mobile phone in 96, what else can they do? Can they hook into their car? Can they create a car crash? Of course they can. When I got back, because I had no information of what happened to me, I had to do some research on the internet, which is, to be honest, another form of punishment. You get triggered because you start to research all these things, which are quite... Well, you're basically, you're, you're researching invisible weapons. You're researching surveillance. You're trying to understand. And it was part... It's the only way you can heal is through reading about what other people went through when they went through it. And the, the scary thing is that the way that the machinery worked, it looked like the whole town or the whole village was after you, but really it was only two people doing it. And when I discovered that, I was better able to fight back because you think, okay, well, these other people are just playing along and they don't know what they're doing. They're just having fun. But the actual people who were trying to set up to cause me harm were, were professionals. And so I remember when I saw that, I was able to find my way out of it. And again, it was 2015. And so the whole experience for me was it totally blew my world view. And in order to find out about it, I had to go onto the internet. There was no way I would ever find out about it on mainstream media yet these things have been happening in reality for a very long time. We didn't know anything about it. Had I not been attacked in that way, I wouldn't have really paid much attention to this, this story about this che Chechenian leader because I would have skipped over it. I thought, no, you can never get m m murdered with your mobile phone. That's impossible. But now I totally believe it because it was through the, my mobile phone that I suffered the most physical damage to my body because the, they're beaming energy at you and so they call it a non-lethal weapon at least again I'm finding I'm speaking about what I read on the internet but I, I don't know it could be a lethal weapon I don't know what it was I know what I suffered I know what I went through I know I had tinnitus and vertigo and physically it took me a couple of years to get over what happened to me at that at that time and a lot of it, everything was centered around my mobile phone. So when I made the decision to get rid of my mobile phone and buy a disposable, I realized I was starting to look guilty. And I realized I was starting to do what they wanted me to do. And purchasing one mobile phone to keep me going for a week or a month. or And they could tap into that just as easily as they could tap into my other phone. And so the the 24 hour surveillance thing was the most obnoxious thing I've ever been through. And it, it took me a long time to work out the psychology of not doing what they wanted me to do and not to fall into the traps because this was a whole new form of warfare. And I didn't know I was in an exercise, a military exercise, or I didn't know what was going on. And it was horrific and you do stupid things and you look like you're strung out and you may people will mistake it for drugs or alcohol addiction or they, you know you, you cannot you're wired you do feel like it's find it hard to act normal when you're being chased 24 hours a day and it feels like you're being chased 24 hours a day but what really is happening is you're being surveilled 24 hours a day and they they work in shifts and so they're working to try and trip you up to somehow hurt you put you in jail get you to hurt yourself on and on it goes and it just after about a month of that one month it's like the level of exhaustion that you feel physically is through the roof and so no normal person continue can continue a normal life under those circumstances but because all of the, apart from the two people and the the box of the equipment, which is the size of a suitcase, as long as they can keep hidden, you you look like a tool in that case. And people might want to say that now. If I mention this 1996 story that Tony Gosling mentioned in his talk, 
you know, if I went to the doctors and when I first got back after the attack, I had lost some of my hearing and I'd suffered, I suffered really bad vertigo and tinnitus. And when I tried to talk to the doctor about it, and the doctor politely asks you, well, what's going on? What's happened? And if I described what happened to me, I would, within the first 30 seconds, it would sound like I had a psychotic breakdown. And it would. And how how successful that would be for them if I succumbed to that, which I didn't. So in the end, you know, you just get by and you heal the ailments yourself. Or you just say to the doctor, you know, okay, my skin's flaring up for no reason and my body's cold and my skin's hot and it looks like I'm burned and and the doctor will go okay well we'll see if we can help you with that and you just don't mention what happened because the more you talk about it the more crazy you sound and it separates you from other people it puts you into this category puts you in this isolative space because you now you now have had an experience that nobody can relate to. You don't even understand it yourself. And so when you try to explain it, it comes out all wrong. And, and it's really, the one of the ways I've described it is through the use of technology. It's like having an enforced psychotic breakdown put on upon you. It's like something is being put on you because you experience all these states of mind that you would have never felt, that you would have never reached before. Like, I've been scared in my life before, but I've never felt terror to the point where my organs were being pulled out. You know, I've felt paranoia before, but not to the point where I now don't trust my clients. I've felt, you know, all of these things. I've felt anger and rage before, but I've never felt emotional violence. I never felt violently angry before. And this is all artificial. This was all done by technology. And it's like, I'm quite a happy, peaceful person underneath. But all of a sudden, I'm experiencing these negative emotions to the extreme of extremes. And and there's ways that you can tell that it's artificial. There's ways that you can tell it's not you. But it's part of you get is, is hurt by this, physically hurt. And like I said, I saw many pieces of technology that was used during the attack, but one of the biggest, most scariest things was what happened with through the mobile phone. And for a year afterwards, I did, didn't have a mobile phone or a computer or any technology. And, and when now, since I've seen what that technology can do, I have a totally different perspective on everything almost. It's mean, one of the things, one of the characteristics of this technology is it can completely reverse a situation and make a really good person look like a criminal and vice versa. That's the first thing. So I know, I mean, I, I didn't judge a book by its cover before, but now you get a sense of there's certain characteristics of people Celebrities being interviewed where it kind of looks like they're either being attacked by this technology or they're taking some kind of mind-altering drug or both because the two sometimes work hand in hand. And one of the characteristics is they've got this look of a wild animal in their eyes. And it's that is electricity that's doing that. Sometimes this technology can make people look like that. It can make them look wide-eyed and crazy like a an animal that's being stalked and there's other little telltale signs that you think okay well that looks like technology but it's it's only little clues and you could be wrong you could could be projecting and it's i suppose it's a helpless feeling knowing that you don't know for sure you can't say for sure because you, I know the damage that this technology can do. I know how much it can hurt a person and to not have any defense against it and not to be able to come to someone's defense and say, okay, for sure that person is being attacked. It's It makes you feel helpless, you know, because you want to be able to help. And it's like, I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't know if you need technology to police the technology, to be aware of the technology. I don't know. I'm sure the security services or the police know they must have some kind of clue as to how to monitor this stuff. And I am not in that realm. And I don't, 
and I'm not an expert. But when it starts to happen to me, when I get, if something hits me, I can feel it. There are certain things that I've described, that I've written down, that you notice, that you can say, okay, here it goes, it's starting. And when the really serious stuff was starting, I knew I had a time limit to physically move my person out of the way of danger. I mean, I had like an hour, 60 minutes tops, preferably a lot sooner before something really bad was going to happen. Because I just observed this as a pattern of um, events that came after me. And that was just my experience. Everybody else is different. And the levels of danger move move up a level. And I'm speaking about like the, the the last level before something really serious happens. Um and I kinda experienced that on and off for seven months. It kinda followed me around and it, it was only like I said, it was seven months to a year of my life. And that was long enough to change my personality. But just to give you an example, if I was a, anyone and I had to sit down for a job interview for an hour and a half to two hours opposite one particular person during that time, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Not while I was in that danger zone. But so later, when I when I got out and I found a friend to stay with and it started to quiet down a lot, I was able to do normal things. I was able to go to the hairdresser for an hour and just sit there. But because I had been in this pattern of being chased, you know, sitting down for an hour to get my hair done was just full of anxiety and stress. And it was like I was in a battlefield and I was just getting my hair done. But yet my whole body was in this... I'm like, what? What if they start coming after me again? What if the zapping starts again? What if? What if the? What if the lights show up again? What if all of that? It, it somehow, in the end, it started to f- feel because they're using sound weapons. I would hear. I would hear the the beginning of it internally. I don't know if I heard it with my ears or in my mind. I would hear the abuse, I call it abuse, or it's like a a wave of abuse. It starts like that and then it it takes on this more organised, orchestrated feeling to it. And you know, if if you're in the middle of that, you have to get out, you have to remove yourself from it. So I was in a pattern of being chased by that for a while. So obviously, I'd gotten into this Pavlovian thing where my body would produce that same stress response even though nothing was happening and it's almost like someone who loses their legs in an accident they have to learn to walk again it was like I had to learn to live again I had to learn to go to the hairdressers and sit for an hour and understand that nothing was going to happen but even though I would come out of the hairdressers and there would still be a little bit of weirdness there would still still be triggers and other things but anyway I digress to finish this up, what I'm saying is uh, this this technology exists. From what I know, it's extremely expensive. From what I know is I think you need probably skill to use it. I think it, it belongs to the military somewhere or the security services or that realm. But if this technology exists, it's bound to get into the wrong hands at some point. You know, I mean, if it's not policed, I read somewhere that Russia had banned all of these types of weapons, but I'm not sure if that's true. I think that'll eventually have to happen here because um, in 2015, a British Airways pilot lost his eyesight when a child, a teenager, flashed a military grade laser up at the airplane and the pilot lost his sight. So I think there's going to have to be some kind of new laws to come in to police this. In the next clip, Martin Bashir is talking on the day that Michael Jackson died. I think all of us were shocked and deeply saddened by the news today. 
Uh, I was actually out running in Central Park when I heard and came home, showered and came into the office. Uh, many of us were excited about the prospect of him performing in London. Thousands of people had bought tickets from all over the world. And now to hear this news is, is very, very sad. I think it's worth remembering that he was probably, singly, the greatest dancer and musician the world has ever seen. Certainly when I made the documentary, there was a small part of that which uh, contained a controversy uh, concerning his relationship uh, with other young people. But the truth is that uh, he was never convicted of any crime. I never saw any wrongdoing myself. And whilst his lifestyle may have been a bit unorthodox, I don't believe it was criminal. And uh, I think the world has now lost the greatest entertainer it's probably ever known.